name is Mrs. Mogelson, and I'm a second grade teacher at Olympic Hills Elementary School. I feel so lucky to be here with you today and for the next two weeks. I know your teachers are missing being with you very, very much, just like I'm really missing being with my class. So I feel really fortunate to be here with you. For today's lesson, you will need books at your Just Right reading level, and you'll need either this week's learning packet or a piece of paper. Also, we'll be stopping several times to think as we're reading today. So if you have someone who's able to watch this video with you and listen to you share your thinking and share their thinking with you, that's great. If not, that's okay. Just make sure you're doing your own thinking. The book we're going to read today is called An Angel for Solomon Singer. It's written by Cynthia Ryland and Pete, it, excuse me, it is um, illustrated and the paintings are done by Peter Catalanato. It's published by Orchard Publishing. Some of you might remember the author Cynthia Ryland if you have read a Poppleton book or uh, one of the Henry and Mudge stories. I'd like to remind you that wondering means you're sharing what you're curious about, and when you're questioning, you're asking questions about what you wonder. Thinking about the title, what do you wonder about this story? Some wonderings that other students have had are, why is Solomon Singer standing in wheat if he lives in a city? Who is that man in the restaurant? Why is the book called An Angel for Solomon Singer? You may have had some of these same wonderings or your wonderings may have been different. As I'm reading today, I'd like you to think about these wonderings, but also notice other wonderings that come up in your mind. We'll be stopping throughout the book to share and think about those wonderings. An angel for Solomon Singer. An angel for Solomon Singer. Solomon Singer lived in a hotel for men near the corner of Columbus Avenue and 85th Street in New York City, and he did not like it. The hotel had none of the things he loved. His room had no balcony, and a balcony is a platform with walls around it that's built out of the side of a building so that people on the upper floors uh, can be able to go outside. This is a picture of a balcony. His room had no balcony. He dreamed of beautiful balconies. It had no fireplace, and he knew he would surely think better sitting before a fireplace. It had no porch swing for napping and no picture window for watching the birds. He could not have a cat. He could not have a dog. He could not even paint his walls a different color. And oh, what a difference a yellow wall or a purple wall would have made. It is important to love where you live. And Solomon Singer loved where he lived, not at all. And it was this that drove him out into the street each night. It was dreams of balconies and purple walls that took him to the street. Solomon Singer wandered. And to wander means to go out and walk around without any particular place in mind that you're trying to get to. What questions do you have? about the story so far. What are you wondering? Some wonderings that other readers have had from this part were, I wonder why Solomon lives in New York if he doesn't like it. I wonder if Solomon Singer will get a home he likes. 
where does Solomon Singer wander? You can give me a same signal if you had a similar wondering. Please continue to notice what you're wondering as we read. Solomon Singer wandered. He was a wanderer by nature, and by nature means that you do something uh, because it's just part of who you are. He was a wanderer by nature anyway. He had grown up in Indiana, a place absolutely famous for wandering. So much of Indiana was mixed into his blood that even now, 50 odd years later, he could not have given up being a boy in Indiana. And at night he journeyed the streets, wishing they were fields, gazed at lighted windows, wishing they were stars, and listened to the voices of all who passed, wishing for the conversation of crickets. And conversation means uh, talking. So he's missing the conversation of crickets. Solomon Singer was lonely and he had no one to love, not even a place to love. And this was hard for him. He didn't feel happy as he wandered. One evening, somewhere between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West, Solomon Singer wandered into a small restaurant called the Westway Cafe. He liked the name. He was from the Midwest, and Midwest means the part of the country that's in the center. He was from the Midwest and liked to imagine he was each day making his way west, that someday he would be west, and so the name meant something to him. He opened the plastic menu before him, and there he read these words, the Westway Cafe, where all your dreams come true. The menu told him how much hamburgers and bowls of soup and pieces of pie and other things cost, but they didn't put a price on dreams. I'd like you to think about this part of the story now. What questions do you have, or what do you wonder about this part of the story? Something, wonderings and questions that some students have had when they've heard this part are, is the cafe magic? I wonder if Solomon will meet the man from the window on the front cover. but it didn't put a price on dreams. A voice quiet like Indiana Pines said, good evening, sir. And Solomon Singer looked up into a pair of brown eyes that were lined at the corners from a life of smiling. Solomon Singer smiled back up at the waiter and ordered a bowl of tomato soup, a cup of coffee and a balcony but he didn't say the word balcony out loud. The tomato soup was delicious and he even got a second cup of coffee free. And the smiling eyed waiter told Solomon Singer to come back again to the Westway Cafe. Solomon Singer did the very next day. He ordered two biscuits and some bacon and a large glass of grapefruit juice and a fireplace, but he didn't say fireplace out loud. The smiling eyed waiter was glad to see him, glad to have him and told him, come back again. And Solomon Singer did the very next night. For many, many nights, Solomon Singer made his way west, carrying a dream in his head, each night ordering it up with his supper. When he reached the end of his list of dreams, the end was a purple wall, he simply started over again and ordered up a balcony, but he didn't say the balcony out loud. And 
and slowly and quietly with time, something happened. On Solomon Singer's walks every night to the Westway Cafe, the streets began to move before him like fields of wheat, and, the, and he thought them beautiful. The lights in the buildings twinkled and shone like stars, and he thought them lovely. And the voices of all who passed sounded like conversations of friendly crickets, and he felt friendly toward them. What questions do you have, or what do you wonder at this point of the story? Some wonderings other students have had are, I wonder why he keeps ordering parts of houses in his head. Why is Solomon Singer happy now? And the voices of all who passed sounded like conversations of friendly crickets, and he felt friendly toward them. Rounding the corner of Columbus Avenue, seeing the lighted window of the Westway Cafe, Solomon Singer felt as he had as a boy, rounding the bend in Indiana and seeing the yellow lights of the house where he lived. Walking into the Westway Cafe, he felt at home as he had in Indiana, and the smiling waiter greeted him as familiarly as his parents had once greeted him in Indiana, where he would come in from wandering the roads he loved. The waiter's name, it turned out, was Angel. Can you move the book closer? And what do you notice about how on hell is spelled? The waiter's name, it turned out, was on hell. Solomon Singer went to the Westway Cafe every night for dinner the first year, and he dines there still. He hasn't given up carrying a dream in his head each time he goes, and one of his dreams has even come true. He has sneaked a cat into his hotel room. Solomon Singer found a place he loves and doesn't feel lonely anymore. And if you are ever near the Westway Cafe, wishing instead you were in a field of conversational crickets beneath the shining stars, go inside and on hell will take your order and Solomon Singer will smile and make you feel you are home. When we wonder and ask questions as we read, we are helping our brains to be active. We notice things that we are curious about, and we also notice when these wonderings or questions are explained. I'm now going to reread this book without stopping. As I'm reading, I'd like you to think about all of our wonderings and notice when or if some of the wonderings are being explained. The wonderings we are going to think about are, why is Solomon Singer standing in wheat if he lives in a city? Who is that man in the restaurant? Why is the book called An Angel for Solomon Singer? I wonder why Solomon lives in New York if he doesn't like it. I wonder if Solomon Singer will get a home he likes. Where does Solomon Singer wander? Is the cafe magic? I wonder if Solomon will meet a man from the front cover. I wonder why he keeps ordering parts of a house in his head. Why is Solomon Singer happy now? Please keep these wonderings in your mind as I reread the story to you. An angel for Solomon Singer.
Solomon Singer lived in a hotel for men near the corner of Columbus Avenue and 85th Street in New York City, and he did not like it. The hotel had none of the things he loved. His room had no balcony. He dreamed of beautiful balconies. It had no fireplace, and he knew he would surely think better sitting in front of a fireplace. It had no porch swing for napping and no picture window for watching the birds. He could not have a cat. He could not have a dog. He could not even paint his walls a different color. And oh, what a difference a yellow wall or purple wall would have made. It is important to love where you live and Solomon Singer loved where he lived, not at all. And it was this that drove him out into the street each night. It was dreams of balconies and purple walls that took him to the street. Solomon Singer wandered. He was a wanderer by nature anyway. He had grown up in Indiana, a place absolutely famous for wandering. So much of Indiana was mixed into his blood that even now, 50 odd years later, he could not give up being a boy in Indiana. And at night, he journeyed the streets, wishing they were fields, gazed at lighted windows, wishing they were stars, listened to voices of all who passed, wishing for the conversation of crickets. Solomon Singer was lonely and had no one to love, not even a place to love, and this was hard for him. He did not feel happy as he wandered. One evening, somewhere between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West, Solomon Singer wandered into a small restaurant called the Westway Cafe. He liked the name. He was from the Midwest, and he liked to imagine he was, each day, making his way west that someday he would again be West, so the name meant something to him. He opened up the plastic menu before him, and there he read these words, the Westway Cafe, where all your dreams come true. The menu told him how much hamburgers and bowls of soup and pieces of pie and other things cost, but it didn't put a price on dreams. A voice like quiet Indiana pines in November said, Good evening, sir. And Solomon Singer looked up into a pair of brown eyes that were lined at the corners from a life of smiling. Solomon Singer smiled back and ordered a bowl of tomato soup, a cup of coffee, and a balcony. But he didn't say balcony out loud. The tomato soup was delicious, and he even got a second cup of coffee free. And the smiling-eyed waiter told Solomon Singer to come back again to the Westway Cafe. Solomon Singer did, the very next night. He ordered two biscuits and some bacon and a large glass of grapefruit juice and a fireplace. But he didn't say fireplace out loud. The smiling-eyed waiter was glad to see him, glad to have him, and told him, come back again. And Solomon Singer did the very next night. For many, many nights, Solomon Singer made his way west, carrying a dream in his head, each night ordering it up with his supper. When he reached the end of his list of dreams, which was a purple wall, he simply started over again and ordered up a balcony, but he didn't say balcony out loud. And slowly and quietly, with time, something happened. On Solomon Singer's walks each night to the Westway Cafe, the streets began to move before him like fields of wheat, and he thought them beautiful. The lights in the building twinkled and shone like stars, and he thought them lovely. And the voices of all who passed sounded like the conversations of friendly crickets, and he felt friendly toward them. Rounding the corner off Columbus Avenue, seeing the lighted window of the Westway Cafe, Solomon Singer felt as he had as a boy, rounding the bend in Indiana, 
and seeing the yellow lights of the house where he lived. Walking into the Westway Cafe, he felt at home as he had in Indiana, and the smiling waiter greeted him as familiarly as his parents had once greeted him in Indiana, and he would come in from the wandering roads he loved. The waiter's name, as it turned out, was on hell. Solomon Singer went to the Westway Cafe every night for dinner that first year, and he dines there still. He hasn't given up carrying a dream in his head each time he goes, and one of his dreams has even come true. He sneaked a cat into his hotel room. Solomon Singer has found a place that he loves, and he doesn't feel lonely anymore. And if you are ever near the Westway Cafe, wishing instead you were in a field of conversational crickets beneath the shining stars, go inside and Angel will take your order and Solomon Singer will smile and make you feel at home. Which wonderings and questions do you think were explained and why? When I was reading, I thought many of our wonderings were explained, but some of the explanations were right there and others I had to figure out by using clues. Here are some of the explanations that I noticed. Who was that man in the restaurant? It was on hell. Why is the book called An Angel for Solomon Singer? I thought that one was a little bit more tricky. The waiter's name was on hell which is spelled like angel, and his kindness and friendliness helped Solomon feel like he belonged in New York City. So I think it probably has something to do with that. I wonder why Solomon Singer lives in New York City if he doesn't like it. That one we never found an answer to. We never find out how he went from living in Indiana to living in New York City. Today, we focused on wondering and questioning. When we wonder and question, we activate our brains uh, and we help ourselves to notice when our wonderings are explained. This kind of thinking helps us remember what we're reading, but it also helps us to think more deeply about the books that we're reading. Now it's time for IDR for individualized daily reading. This is the time that you will need your Just Write books and you'll either need your learning packet or a piece of paper. I want to remind you that we learned from Ms. Keller that a Just Write book is a book that you are able to read with only having to problem solve two or three words and that you are able to retell each part to yourself. Before you start your IDR time today, I want to remind you that sometimes, even though a book is a just right book, you might find parts that you don't understand. When that happens, you need to use a fix-up strategy. So I'd like to remind you about the fix-up strategies that you have learned. One fix-up strategy that you can use when you don't understand a part of the book is to back up and reread that part of the book more slowly and carefully. Another fix-up strategy that you have learned is that you can turn the page and read just the very next page to see if it gives you some information that helps you understand what you're reading. The IDR book that I have been reading is called Dragons in a Bag. The author is Zeta Elliott. I'm on chapter four right now and when I read the first page of chapter four, I understood part of what was happening, but not everything. When I read the page the first time, I understood that the main character, Jackson, felt different when he was around the character, Ma, but I didn't understand why he felt that way. So I'm going to try my fix-up strategy of rereading just that first page to help myself see if I can notice some other clues that help me 
to um, that help me to figure out what maybe why he is uh, feeling different than uh, um, than around Ma than around other people. I open my mouth to reply, but then realize Ma doesn't expect me to say a word. My cheeks tingle with shame as I stoop to pick up the dented bread box. I set it on the table and then shove my hands into my pockets to keep them from finding any more trouble. I open my mouth to tell Ma that I'm usually a very obedient boy, but no words come out. I almost never break the rules at home, but things feel different here. I feel different here. That's the part I got last time. I want to ask Ma a dozen questions, but the stern look on the strange old lady's face tells me I better keep my questions to myself for now. I think I understand now. I didn't pay attention last time to the part where I read that uh, Ma had a stern look and made him feel like he couldn't ask any questions. I can figure out from those clues that he feels different because he's afraid of Ma and he doesn't know uh, how to act around her like he knows how to act around other people. When I reread that section, I was able to pick up on those extra clues that I missed the first time. As you read for your 25 minutes today, I'd like you to stop and retell each page as you are reading. If you realize that you don't understand a part, make sure you back up and reread or go on to the next page to check and see if you have more information. At the end of your IDR reading time today, find someone who you can show one of the pages you used a fix-up strategy on. Please remember to also uh, use your learning packet to write down both some of your wonderings and maybe some of the fix-up strategies that you used. I hope you enjoy your IDR time and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks.